I, I read the book. Thank I, you. Uh, I got it the other day, went through the entire book in like two days. Absolutely loved it. Uh, I think we were working together when you first started talking about wanting to write a book. Uh, I mean, you know, 25 years, whatever, 1989, your first Iron Man. Uh, how, how did you put it all together? Like, how did you get the stories and like figure out the framework? Well, I, I have, I've always been a uh, diary note taker of events. So if I got home from an event and, and as a matter of fact, <laughs> It's it's all it's all in this thing, and if, there's even the original pages of of the events with the notes, what the weather was like, who won the race, what I thought of it, and so I I've always done that, and I decided I go well let me start taking a look at that stuff. Well, it wasn't detailed enough. Then I started thinking, well, I've come across a lot of stories that that inspired me. Why don't I just put those people in the book and maybe they'll inspire others. And I, I did it. I, I felt it would be selfish if I didn't put a book together on some of these stories. And some were stories that were on the NBC TV, but others were stories that people just never heard about, but they always seemed to want to tell me because they knew I was going to call their name and bring them in. And they wanted me to know their backstory. And I did too. So I'd always have this stuff flowing in now, what am I going to do with it? What am I? And I always stored it somewhere. That's what I did. I started researching and, and, uh, the stories that affected me, I'd start reading something. I go, Oh, oh my God. I remember that. That was unbelievable. I gotta, I gotta see if I can find this person again. And I'd go out and try to find him. So, uh, it was a serious labor of love. <laughs> yeah. I, we, we were, uh, kind of going back and forth bef uh, bef before the show and, uh, you know, I was explaining to you, you know, one of the, the reasons why I originally started this podcast was that connection between entrepreneurship and athletics and, and specifically around athletics, the, you know, the need to be, you know, resilient and perseverance and endurance and fearlessness and, you know, having a, a goal and training towards that goal and, and all those types of things, because ultimately starting a company being successful in business is, is, is the same thing. There are no shortcuts. And, and I basically said, you know, I, I mean, Iron Man is like the epitome of that. There um, are no shortcuts. And yeah. I, I think if Iron Man has taught me one major thing, it's to finish what you start. Can you imagine if everybody in the world finished what they started, what kind of humans they'd be and the, the world would be? But in sports, we always saw that, Greg. We saw, you know what? You're, you're up against the nose tackle at the start of the game. You got to finish with this, dude, and you got to do the best you can do. You're not going to walk off and go, oh, I'm done. You're not going right. to be halfway through a race, and you'll kick yourself in the butt for the rest of your life. So finishing what you start is what I learned the most. And when I started seeing some people that in life were going through horrendous physical stuff, uh, diseases, loss of a loved one, but yet they kept moving forward to try to get to a finish line, uh, whether it was daily, you know, just to get through the day yeah. or whether it was that, you know, Ironman finish line. Uh, that's what it taught me the most. And that's why the sport and the entrepreneur and the business connection is so strong because the most successful people in business that I've come across uh, are always finding a finish line on a physical side. Always. Well, and, and the demographic, right? You talk a little bit about it uh, in the book, but I, you know, I, I knew it just coming from the, the space a little bit. The demographic of your typical person doing Ironman are, in many cases, people who have been very successful professionally. Yes. Uh, people say, hey, you've called some famous people across the line, you know, and and I have. I've called owners of baseball teams and governors and and it just goes on and on. And the one thing that Iron Man and the and the tough nature of the event, it equalizes everybody into really the same person. Someone that set this big ass goal to get to the finish line after 140.6 miles, no matter if you're a billionaire or you just got out of college and you're trying to find your way, uh, it, it equalizes everything. And that that's why I think people that are very, very successful are, are drawn to it because they want to they want another mountain. 
They want another mountain. But now what I'm finding and seeing is, my gosh, this this first timer is only 24 years old and she just got her first job and she's climbing the Ironman mountain. I always think when I call young ones in, Greg, my gosh, there's going to be, I, if I had a company, I'd hire that one. I'd hire that That's one. Right. I'd hire that one because you know, they're going to be successful. Yeah. So let, let, let's take a step back. I, I think most people, everyone's probably heard of Iron Man. I think a lot of people out there sort of know what an Iron Man is, but maybe just take a second for anybody out there that's not familiar with what exactly an Iron Man triathlon is. Well, the, the sport of triathlon is swim, bike, run. It was born and bred right here in San Diego. And uh, in 1978, uh, Commander John Collins of the United States Navy was stationed in Oahu with a bunch of his buddies. They ran a 10K race. You know, they worked out all the time. And there was Navy guys there and Marines. And after the race, they sat around drinking beer. And Collins said, uh, I wonder who the fittest athletes in the world were or are. And they started arguing about it. Well, it has to be a swimmer, you know, the endurance or a cyclist or a runner. And and they were drinking a little more. And finally, Collins <laughs> said, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll do the Waikiki Rough Water Swim, which is 2.4 miles, which, you know, is, is an organized event over there. Then we'll ride around the island of Oahu, which is a, a bike ride there. Then we'll run the Honolulu Marathon. And they all looked at him and said, Collins, you're crazy. We've already done those things. And this is, this is, the, this is the mind of a true champion. Yeah, I know we've done those things. But we're going to do them on the same day. And whoever finishes will be an Ironman. So there was 15 of them showed up at Waikiki Beach in 78. 12 of them finished. Took some of them 24 hours. 23-year-old uh, United States Marine Dave Orlowski, who we just lost last year, uh, did it in cutoff shorts and stopped at McDonald's for his aid station. The stories are – but it grew into this event where now we have – 40 full distance Ironmans worldwide and over 200 half iron 70.3 distance Ironmans worldwide. And that's what Ironman is. It's, it's from the thought of a, of a, a, a guy who said, you know what? We can do more than those individual events. We can do them together. And, and the world took hold to it. And, and now there's, you know, every year there's, uh, about, uh, I think it's three or 400,000 Ironman finishers throughout the world. So That's what Iron Man is. <laughs> so, you know, reading, reading the book, um, you know, I, it, like, it, it made me want to do one so bad. And then <laughs> at the same time, like, scared the death out of me at the same time, right? Because I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm like, God, that'd be so, so amazing to do that. And, and, you know, I like to take on challenges and like to do things. And plus, you know, I'd have to find a way to, to, to definitely do an event that you were calling because I, I, I'd want to hear you, <laughs> you, you call me in. <laughs> Uh, but then you start to put perspective and, and, uh, the training side of it, I, I think is, is the biggest issue. I actually have a really cool quote that you basically, that says something like people come up to you all the time and they say, I could do a tri a triathlon if I trained for it. And you're like, yeah, the, if is the biggest part of the, the training. Um, but for perspective, right. I don't know the mean time, the average time of your, your run of the mill triathlete, not that there is such thing. 14, 15 hours, 13 to 15 hours. How much time are you in the water? I'm not talking the world champions, like, but just, you know, you're, you're, you're run of the mill, normal kind of middle of the pack person. How long are you in the water? How long are you in the saddle? How long are you running? The, the average is, uh, I think it's, it's hanging right around 13 hours. You know, the winners come in in eight hours. Uh, matter of fact, we just had a Nor Norwegian, uh, I called it in Florida and he went seven 42 and then his countrymen went 720 something for uh in yeah the, the times are going is that down the new world is that the new world record that's the new iron man world record yeah and so uh a 13 hour person doing average they'll be in the water an hour and a half to an hour and 40 they'll be on that bike for seven to seven and a half eight hours and then they'll run you know four hours and 30 minutes five hours to get in and uh, you have, you have from the time the race starts 17 hours to finish and there's a swim cutoff. You got to be out of the water in two twenty. You got to be off the bike in 10 and a half hours and you got to finish before midnight, uh, to be an official Ironman finisher. So we, we have them all walks of life from 18 to the last race I had, I had an 84 year old, you know, start the race. Uh, darn it. He didn't get, he didn't finish, didn't get off the bike in time, but, yeah. but he started. And that I said to him afterwards, I go, 
you are such a champion. No, Mike, I didn't. Here he's 84. And he, and no, I, I, I got to get out there next time and I got to do it. I didn't. You're a champion. You got to, you're 84, dude. Everybody's grandparents out here are home and on their lazy boy. You know what I mean? And, and, yeah. but that's, that's the type of people that gravitate to Ironman. Yeah. And was it, would, it, would that have been their first Ironman or was it someone who had already been in? No, Ironman? he's done. He's done quite a few. Yeah. He's done. He's done quite a few. Done quite a few. Usually, I know I had in uh, Arizona. I had a couple of 63, 64 year olds that did their first. And when I bring them in, I go. By the way, here's Billy Brown from San Antonio, sixty four years old. His first Ironman. The place goes insane. They're going. Yeah. And then I'll say something like the crowd, and you're worrying about your sore feet standing there. You're thirty five years old. Guys will look. Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but it it just uh, it's infectious. It really is. Did did I see two hundred? What, what was the? I thought I saw some congratulations to you the other day. Yeah, how Arizona. Many you, how many was, have you done now? Arizona was my two hundredth call of an Ironman. The two hundredth call. Man. So for anybody out there listening, and and I've been lucky enough to to experience it a little bit closer. You know, we just talked about this, right? You you. This isn't something that you train for in weeks. In, in many cases, you're training months and months and potentially up to a year to be able to be in this type of shape. And you're thinking about it. You're dedicating your life to it. You know, you've set this goal for yourself. And then you have the event itself where, you know, 13 hours, two hours in the water, hour and 45 minutes, seven hours on a bike, which sounds insane to me. <laughs> and then you want a full marathon to end it out. And when you're coming into the finish line, right, at the end of this unbelievable journey, you are the voice. You are the person who is calling that 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 person in. Not not exclusively, of course, but probably the most well known. And the meaning that that has been to so many people's lives, and I think that that comes out in the book, and I've I've seen it firsthand in, in restaurants, it is unbelievable, right? Like, I mean, you you you're asked constantly to sort of give your catchphrase. And I mean, you, I mean, t t tell me about some of the stories, some of the, the people that you've come across that are just. Well, I, it, it was probably, I started in Kona 89. I didn't say those four words till 91. Uh, you know, I've got that story in the book as to why and, and yeah. why I did it then. But it was about 10 years, Greg, that I just made the call. Uh, you know, you're an Ironman. Cool, cool. But then people started coming up to me and telling me, by the way, you just changed my life. I go, no, what do you mean? I didn't, your call just changed my life. They, then they'd tell me what they were going through and what they battled and, and uh, what their family was battling. And everybody has a backstory. And it started to hit me. I go, this is not about declaring someone an Iron Man. It's about telling them there's somebody else. They're new. They, they're renewed. They've coped with what has come their way. They transform themselves into a human they actually like now. And a lot of people go through life not liking themselves. They've battled illnesses, mental and physical. And and it, that, it was about that 10-year mark. I go, oh my gosh. Just, you know, I, I would talk to my Riley. Don't freaking take this for granted. Don't throw those words out as if, you know, hey, your hamburger's ready. You know, it, it, yeah. don't throw these words. These words are uh, doing stuff to people and for people. Mm -hmm. And when I got that in my frame of mind, it actually started building me up as a better person. Uh, yeah. Not that I look for that, but it just started happening. And then I'd see somebody's face when I called him an Iron Man, and I'd see him straighten up after, you know, being out there 15 hours and leaning and tough time. And, and when that call came, it's like the world is perfect. Their world now is almost perfect. So that yeah. call became, you know, it's not a declaration of, of uh, saying you're a finisher. It's a declaration of who you've become. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I really appreciated in, you know, your story and, and having known you for as long as I have now and haven't seen you firsthand is this concept of like you, you don't phone it in like you're you treat every race like it's the most important race. You you treat every call like it's the most important call. And I, I think that's that's something a lot of people 
don't necessarily do. They take shortcuts and it's like, well, you know, this is Heinz Ward, NFL Super Bowl champ. I'll make sure I give him everything. And this is whoever I'm not going to carry. You, you treat everybody the same when you're out there, right? I, I don't, I, I, you know, it's like, I don't care who you are. I care who you are on that day. Yeah. Uh, and it, you, you're right. It, it becomes a, I look at it like I'm having a one-on-one -on -one conversation. When I'm having a one-on-one -on -one conversation like you and I right now, I'm into it. You're into it. People are into their one-on-one -on -one conversations if they're truly right. engaged. And that's what I want to have with each person, with each finisher. You know, I, I when I call out their name and I say where they're from and and uh, how old they are or, or what their profession is, and then I call them an Ironman, that's me just saying, you know, you're the best in the world, dude. You, you did yeah. it. You are the best in the world at that moment on that finish line. Yeah. No doubt in my mind. And yeah. I, I think having that attitude gives me the passion to give it to them because it's all about them. It's not about Mike Riley making the call. It's about being able to enhance someone else's life at a time that they deserve. Uh, yeah. you know, they say, if you go through life and make other people's lives happy, you're, you're doing something right. And I get to do it 2,500 times an event. I mean, yeah. uh, it's, it's, it's a blessing. It's, it's, it's a blessing. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to compare you to a beetle right now. So like oh. <laughs> one of the, be the Beatles beetles. So bear, bear, bear with me here. I, I, I was listening to this interview one time with Paul McCartney and he was talking about, you know, being a beetle and what it's like and when people come up to him and, you know, he, and he's gracious and, you know, pretty kind person and engaged with people. And he made this comment and it, it was, it was similar to a comment you made in the book, um, coming from different perspectives, but he had enough wherewithal. It didn't come from a place of being braggy, but he came from a place of, I know that the moment of somebody coming up and meeting me is a big moment in that person's life. So it's, it's my responsibility to make that moment special. And, and you, you touch upon that in your book, the extent of like, when somebody is crossing that line after an Ironman, you calling them in is really important to them and you owe it to them to give them the due respect. And, and, and I, I really re respect that. That resonated with me in, um, in the book. It, it is amazing when people walk up, Greg, and a, a lot come up and, and if I'm doing a book signing, they have a chance to talk to me. And I, you know, I take a long time. The line could be long and, but, but it's about that person in front of me, but I'll have, you know, 45 year old grown men come up with their two children. And, and he looks at me and hi, Mike, I'm so, and he starts quivering. I'm going, Whoa, what's going on? And almost losing it. You, you don't know how long I've been wanting to meet you. You called me an Ironman eight years ago. and and my kids know I'm an Iron Man, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, he's he's you know passing it on. How good is this? And it's just a you know I don't call an I a home run. I don't call a touchdown because that's for the masses. I have the opportunity to go directly to a person, to every person, and and make that call. Uh, uh, sure, I love baseball. Would I love to sit on my butt for nine innings and call baseball games? It'd be great. But I stand up for seventeen to nineteen hours, and because I know what I get to do for everybody, it it's, yeah. it's actually a long day, but it's a it goes so fast. I go, what? It's almost midnight. <laughs> wow! Here we shoot. So I I've been asked a few times. Um, what's my favorite charity or I've, you know, I've been in a situation where I've had to, to donate a charity and I, I, I go to the challenge athlete foundation. That's, that's, that's what I say. And, 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 you know, that's where I've, I've, I've been able to, you know, po uh, point donations. Mm -hmm. I was introduced to CAF through you and Bob Babbitt. Mm -hmm. uh, initially, I, I think I, I actually, took part in a, a try. I, yeah. I ran, yeah. I, I ran, I took the, the running leg of a, <laughs> of a try. Um, unbelievable organization that you've been a part of, uh, you know, maybe just take a second and talk a little bit about that. Yeah. The challenge, yeah, you know, Bob Babbitt and Jeffrey Esikow and Rick Kozlowski started it out. I remember sitting with them at one of the very first meetings. I go, this would be cool. 
my time, I couldn't, I couldn't put into it at that time running sales and, but they, they, they took the bull by the horn because of a gentleman we all knew that needed a prosthetic, needed a, a van to be able to drive around. But it's grown into this network of, of grants, of giving grants to athletes uh, who lost their leg in a cycling accident or a car accident or was born with a degenerative uh, disease and had, had a leg or an arm taken off. And what, sure, they give prosthetics out and they try to make them whole. But what they really do is they make their mind whole. They, mm -hmm. people walk away and if they're part of the Challenge Athletes Foundation, I wrote about a few of them in the book, Rudy Garcia Tolson and, and uh, others, you know, what, what, what ends up happening, they become even wholer than a person with all their limbs. If you can understand what that means, they, they've overcome all odds and you and I as athletes, if we would lose a limb, I don't know if I could get through that. I don't know. I, I, there'd be a lot of doubt. Challenge Athletes Foundation washes away that doubt for so many young ones. You know, when we go to the race, you see some, you know, they're a year and a half, two years old and they're in a prosthetic. And, and I remember back to my kids that little, I go, I, I couldn't imagine if that happened to my kids, but they are able to wash away that that doubt and create, help create humans that become Paralympians, gold medalists like Rudy. I mean, gold medalists yeah. in, the, in the Paralympics, for goodness sake. So, uh, Sarah Reinerson, another one, uh, the first, you know, amputee, female amputee to finish Ironman, failing the year before and not making the bike cut off and coming back. And, and she didn't need to come back. You know, she, my God, she proved to the world, but she, she wanted to be an Ironman and and she is. So, yeah, the Challenge Athletes Foundation definitely leads the way to create humans that uh, they can't even believe they are. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I would advise anybody out there, uh, you don't even have to participate in the event. Just just come out to yeah. one of the events. Um, you know, as a father and, you know, probably at the time, you know, the first time I, I, I attended one with you, you know, my daughters were in that five and seven two yeah. range or five yeah. and three range. and. Uh, you know, you see these, these young kids, like you said, you know, two, three, year and a half years old with, with prosthetics, but like running around and playing and participating, like there isn't anything different about them than anything else. Right. And I just think that that ability for, you know, that foundation to, you know, take these, um, you know, children and it's not just children, of course, but, um, you know, uh, children hit me close to me as, right. as a dad right. and allow them to live normal lives. And like you said, even, you know, more fulfilling lives mm -hmm. than they might, if they just were, you know, whatever, fully limbed, I guess. But, um, anyways, uh, I, yeah, I mean, it's hard, it's hard to even go from there. There's so many stories in your book that talk about people who have overcome just unbelievable odds and, and, and people who have, you know, uh, had prosthetics and, and double amputees. Uh, one in particular, we just lost recently, probably the most famous, I, I think I first saw him on 60 minutes, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago was Dick Hoyt. Mm. Uh, and what he was able to accomplish with the son. You want to maybe quickly tell people out there who Dick Hoyt is, if they're not familiar with him. Yeah. Dick Hoyt is the father of Rick Hoyt. Rick had, uh, cerebral palsy and, uh, he, you know, one day in Boston, uh, Ricky wanted to participate like his brothers and sisters. So Dick put him in a big chair and, you know, like ran a 5K. And and he saw the look on his son's face like he'd never seen before. He was he was part of it. He was he was competing. And uh, so Rick and Dick, very famous, you know, went on, did like 30 Boston marathons. My first year in Kona, 1989. Uh, they started the race, looked down from the tower, saw this guy wrapping a harness around himself with this inflatable raft behind him. I had no idea who they were. Uh, I just didn't know. And I asked one of them, who's that? Oh, it's a guy that's going to do the race with his son and push him around. I go, what? That's never going to happen. I hear Iron Man? And I sure is shooting. You know, he pulled him in the water. I uh, had him on the front of his bike, which I can't believe against the winds of, of West Hawaii uh, on the big island and then ran and came on in. And when he came in, I, I 
I thought I, I thought I was seeing a miracle in the making. And from, you know, he, he just went on to keep doing that. And now the, the Dick Hoyt foundation and how many, Oh my gosh, how many mothers and daughters and fathers and sons and brothers, uh, Kyle and, and, uh, Brent peace, the peace brothers, uh, just finished Ironman Florida together for the, like the third Ironman. It, it's all because of Dick Hoyt. Uh, it's because he, he knew anything is possible he, for his son and himself. And he proved it over and over again. Not just doing one. He just kept coming back and doing them all. <laughs> he just, just kept and, and like fast times, right? I mean, uh, dude could run, man. He'd run pushing that thing. I swear it looked like he was doing 20 mile an hour pushing it. I go, yeah. he just flying. Yeah, he he's all out. All out. Yeah. Any, anybody out there that doesn't know who Dick Hoyt is, look look him up and you 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 have to see what he was doing. I mean, we just talked about how ridiculously challenging a iron man is uh he was doing it pulling his son in 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 the swim riding his son on his bike and then ultimately pushing him while Mm -hmm. running uh and still competing i mean it's uh, really unbelievable and and the purpose behind it is what's even more special than that um so mike you're 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 obviously known as the voice of iron man uh you know it's 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 been a huge part of your career but it, but it's not all your career, right? Like, I mean, you're, that was, that was, I mean, I, I don't want to call it this, but it was like a part-time gig in many ways. I mean, you, you, you have a full-time career as a, as an extremely accomplished, well, entrepreneur and then sales leader. Yeah. I, I've always, you know, I, I've been fortunate because I'm, I, I've got to produce my income in the endurance world. I was out working out, doing races, the whole deal. I, I, I was teaching school in San Diego. Then opened up running shoe stores with my brother. We had four of those and we sold those and I became a rep. I was repping running shoe lines. I was repping nutrition products. I, you know, selling to all the guys I go work out with. So it was fantastic. And then I just found this, I found this passion about sales. I, I, I love selling product to people and I love uh, giving them something that they could resell and make money from. And, and, uh, uh, so I, I just was doing that constantly. And then, and then in, uh, 99 went to work for a company that was, you know, eight of us at active.com and we started building that machine. Uh, and, and I was doing the sales with that and built a team. I think we had uh, 60 or 80 salespeople at one time leading them through the ranks of, of selling. And I don't know. I just, I've always found sales to be, the hardy, the hardest thing to do, yet the e- easiest, if you prepare, you yeah. you you can't go in blind. And sure, I relied on relationship a lot to get the door open. But at the end of the day, a smart buyer knows good product sells product. Mike Riley or some other salesperson is not going to sell that product off the shelf. It, it ain't going to happen. I can't do that. So uh, they have to realize that you, you, you got to sell them good product. The other part of the scenario is I'd go back to manufacturers, whether it was, uh, I was up in sock and running shoes or a tennis ball. I go, this is what they're telling me. Why this shoe's not selling? They, they, what do you mean? I, it's a good shoe. No, no, it's not because of what they're. So I would be the conduit between a lot of the big dealers in the, in the West and the manufacturer trying to help them build a better product. And then, yeah. you know, obviously I was selling a lot of triathlon products, which I loved and sold bikes. And, and so I was building a career in my passion of endurance sports and uh, building my income in that. And, and announcing was, yeah, it was second because race directors didn't have huge budgets for race announcers, even in the early years. And, and what we get compa- paid compared to, like I said, somebody calling a nine inning game of major league baseball, it, it pales in comparison. And, uh, and that's okay. You know, it's just, just how it is. And, uh, I'm not complaining about what the, the incomes produce, but it's, it's harder in, in our profession than some others. But yeah, sales have always it, it been my passion. I, I, yeah. I just love selling. I mean, if I sell today, it's, yeah, I sell me or I try to sell the book or, you know, and, or sell to speak at a corporations, things like sure. that, but not product. Are you, are you, do, are you doing much speaking now? 
Yeah, I, I have a call this afternoon of, of a San Diego company with a sales kickoff. I think they've got 80, 80 salespeople. I did I did a few during the pandemic on Zoom, which was weird. You know, I'm seeing all these faces yeah. and I'm telling them stories, but you don't get any reaction. I mean, you might mm-hmm. see somebody smile or laugh, but some people may be looking at their phone and I go, this is tough. And so I, I resign myself to the fact, just hopefully you'll get to one or two of them. Hey, there was like a hundred people on the screen, maybe one or two. And I got back yeah. probably 20 or 30 messages. God, that was fantastic. And I go, well, if I got the 20 or 30 of them, uh, and that got to them to where what I say has got, you know, to where they maybe could sell better or be a better manager. Uh, that's great. So I, I did, I did those, but I miss, I want to go back live, man. I want to go back on, on the stage and, and go live. Can't beat it. Can't beat it. You know, I, I, I you know, the obviously COVID has, has forced us to all adopt technology and I think it's accelerated a lot of things and, and I think some good, some bad. Uh, I find the one-on-one conversations like we're having now are actually pretty good. Like I, I've yeah. had very engaging conversations. Me and you were both engaged, but once you get into that mass audience conversation, it just, you, you, like, I think you absolutely nailed it. You just lose that connection. Um, and I know just even running, you know, uh, my company, um, I, I can have my one-on-ones and I think they're really effective through this medium, but once we have like all hands meetings or team meetings, just not the same as it is if you're all in a room together. Yeah. It obviously the one-on-ones are very powerful because the person on the other end that may be working for you, or you're trying to help lead them in a direction they need to go. They know it's about them. So that's easy. When when people are in a group, is he talking about me? Is she talking about me? Does that pertain to my role, my category yeah. I work in? You know, there's so many variables when it's built into that. But when I'm able to give uh, a talk, uh, and and you know, I I intertwine the story I'm telling uh, to why it should help make you a better salesperson, a better manager, a better CEO. Uh, and 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 I believe those stories are stories that hit home and th- that are going to last. I've been, and you have been too, I've been to a lot of conferences with motivational speakers and what they say at that present moment. I go, oh my God, that's funny. That's great. He's right. But I never seem to leave with one bit of it that could help me tremendously. And I mm-hmm. think the stories that I'm able to tell because I've seen and witnessed, uh, I think pimp, some people, they leave because they people will come up to me 10 years later. I remember when you gave a talk to our company and you told that story about that boy that was crushed by the garbage truck. Oh my God. I still remember that today. And I think they remember it like, because he came through and he ended up doing an Ironman and they, they remember those people remember stories. Well, and and you're not, you're not, you're you're not just someone who's telling these unbelievable, amazing stories from your Ironman career. Like, you know, you think about, uh, uh, you know, a lot of athletes, right? I, I, I went to a keynote the other, uh, recently with, um, gosh, I'm, I'm blanking on her name. Uh, the, the tennis player, uh, uh, Billie Jean King. Billie oh, Jean wow. King. Okay. And she was great. It was, she was a spitball She's fireball good. and, and told some amazing stories. Uh, and it was motivational, but she's never been a part of a startup. She's never scaled a startup. You know, she doesn't know what it's like to have to, you know, recruit, hire and fire salespeople. And I think one of the things that you bring to the table is you're not going to only tell those amazing stories of, of, of the different people that have come overcome adversity and, and, and those types of things. You've been in the trenches, right? You, you, you've been a sales guy. You've had a number. You've had to hit numbers, but you've also had to, to build a sales team and motivate a sales team. And, you, you know, so I think that that brings something different than, you know, maybe someone who just comes purely from an athletic background. It does, because whenever you are part of a startup, (laughs) trust me, there's more down days than up days. In that first three, four years, you're going, what are we doing here? Uh, And then you have people working with you, getting despondent and wanting to leave. And, and, and it's just, and then when you think you're at the top of the mountain, you get knocked down again, you go, oh my gosh, what happened? So, I think being in the trenches like that, you, you've got to keep positive. Obviously, it's easy to say that, but when day after day after day you start getting, you get pounded, 
you know, wait a minute. What it's, you finally have to go, we're doing something wrong here. We, we've got to change direction. We've got to pivot here or, or we're going out of business and pivoting sometimes is the hardest thing in the world to do. People do not like change. You know, mm-hmm. they hate it. Jesus. And, and so many times at active, we had to pivot. Uh, when you and I worked together at events.com, it was pivoting almost every day going back and forth. What do we do here? You know, another startup. So what I think it does is when you're in that world, uh, it smooths those rough edges so that the highs are great, but you don't, you know, go on a bender for eight weeks because you did something great. The lows yeah. are bad, but you don't put yourself in the bottom of that hole. You, you're always halfway up it going, okay, I'm going to get out of here. Because if you don't, yeah. you, you, you're going to lose. And that's right. athletes don't like to lose. And that's why the, I, I love your podcast because you're combining, you know, even though you can remember the tough losses you had at San Diego State or when you got your butt kicked by some guy, you go, oh, my God, he's so fast. But you remember that. But you know what? You came out the next game. You learned from it. And you go, all yeah. right, we won this one. And that's the, way business, that's the way business is. Yeah, no, you don't like to lose, but you sure as hell aren't going to win every day. <laughs> yeah, and, and the opposite's just as true, right? In, in athletics, you go out there and you have a big win. If you go out the next week and you're like, I don't need to even prepare. I don't need to practice. I'm the best. Did you see what we did last week? You're going to get your ass handed to you the next week. And, and I think it's the same as, as in business, right? Like, all right, great. Things are going well. You had a good quarter. You move in the right direction. You just closed this round. You can't get complacent. It's like, celebrate it. Celebrate it. Let's, let's, let's be happy. But at the same time, like, got to keep grinding. Got to keep grinding. Right. Um, that's why, that's why people ask, cause I don't race a lot cause I'm at races. So I don't, but I still work out a lot. And I'm, I could be out with some guys doing an 80 mile ride and, you know, in North County here. So, you know, we're climbing. Riley, what are you training for? Aren't you? T- I go, I am. I'm training for life. I'm just trying to, yeah. I'm just trying to stay healthy and happy. And, and this makes me happy. So I, I yeah, you know, it, it's all about the journey. It, you, you remember some of those workout and practices wrestling in college. Yeah. And I remember some workouts that were so much better than any match I ever had uh, because right. you just gave it all, you know, and you had to go up against three or four different guys and, and you'd walk out going that I still remember them today you know, throwing up after you leaving the room. I think, I think I gave it everything I had. <laughs> you know? So uh, I got to ask you this question. Uh, I, I've known you now for a while. I'm sure you're not far off of the weight you were when you were wrestling in college. You, you, you stay, you always stay in great shape. Um, I remember you riding your bike to work 20 miles, <laughs> whatever it was. You just mentioned you, 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 you know, do 80, 80 mile bike rides. I know you're a sub three hour marathon or at least were, were yeah. but you've never, but, but, but you never did an Ironman, uh, which, which was, was a choice. What, well, what, 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 yeah, it was a choice later on. I mean, I, 89 is when I really wanted to do Conan. I was training for it, but that's, that's when I got the call, the call, you yeah. know, and yeah, I was called up to the big leagues and I actually said, no, if, first couple of calls they made sure because I was doing the race. It was all buddies were doing it. We were training, running, doing everything in the pool every morning and, and, uh, going over there. And, but then the call came and, and, uh, I, I figured, well, you know what? I can always do that race. Well, that was 32 years ago and, yeah. and I'm never going to, you know, I, my Ironman now is being able to call others an Ironman. I, I, that gives me more satisfaction than crossing that finish line. I mean, I remember yeah. the first marathon I ran. I can remember it like it was yesterday. I couldn't believe the feeling of euphoria, euphoria I had. Even after wrestling and playing sports, high school and college, coming across that marathon finish line, because, I, because for most of my life, I believed I couldn't do it until I signed up and decided I'm going to do it. I'll try to do it. I'll put the training in. And so when I came across that line, it was euphoria. And so that's what I think people feel about, you know, businesses when they succeed and they sell a business, they do well. Wow. But they, they always want to go do the next one. I wanted to do more marathons. I wanted that feeling over and over again. You know, yeah. Yeah, you, you win a game, you go, I want to win again. I like this. That's right. 
That's right. So uh, you got a, a a great podcast. I enjoy a lot. Thank you. Find your finish line. How uh, how 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 has it been been being a podcaster? Have you have you enjoyed it? I think I've enjoyed it. You know, there's there's obviously as you know work involved and getting guests and hooking up schedules so that you can <laughs> you know match them up. And a lot of my guests are global, so uh, you know I'm interviewing somebody at two a.m. here because it's morning their time and. Uh, but that, I don't care. I mean, I, it's not about the sleep or anything, but I think the biggest thing I'm getting out of it, even people that I know, if I have them on as a guest, what I learn about them, I, I had no idea you did that or you were, you're like that, or that's where you came from. I mean, Joe DeSena, the creator and founder of Spartan, I met him when he was doing Ironman back in Lake Placid in 99 as, as a, as a executive, they had an executive division because he had built and sold a wall street firm from his pool cleaning business that he started in high school. So his story alone, you know, is, is and, nuts. And just, you, you missed the important part of that. It, it. It's his pool cleaning business that he started in high school. That was primarily to the organized crime families that lived in his neighborhood. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. All the, all the, in, in Jersey and New York, all the families, he worked for all yeah. the families. Uh, yeah. No, but, but, so, so yeah, I like the podcast because I find out things about people. I like telling, having people on that are just quote unquote every day, just like you and yeah. I, but they've gone through some um, just uh, uh, amazing hurdles they've jumped over. Uh, yeah. And I want to introduce people to people like that. Sure. I've had Lionel Sanders, one of the most gregarious professional men in our sport and just, uh, you know, a, a crack up and uh, a training insane training guy he he you know i'll have pros on like that but i love having the age groupers on too or the guys like joe who have built a business into multi-million dollar and and if you listen to that podcast when he talked about the pandemic and, mm -hmm. and saying that's this is the hardest thing i've ever gone through and we're talking about a guy who raced the iditarod race in alaska on foot and and going this pandemic is the hardest thing it mentally, you could see it. Be, it's beating him up, but he'll he'll, he'll come out on top. So I, I listened to that episode. Uh, I know Joe a little bit. Um, I met him at events, and then we did a little bit, uh, a couple things we were working on together afterwards. Uh, he's an absolute wild man. Um, <laughs> such an interesting uh, character. I, I, anybody out there, please listen to that episode. I love uh, him. Find your first time. But, you know, there, there was one part that stuck out to me. I, I've talked about it a little bit on this show. Uh, because, you know, the original, I, I guess the idea when I was putting this together was about grit. It was just about like, what, what makes somebody successful? Like what is a high achieving individual in life? And so much of it just comes down to just grit, the ability to just grind and work and think it, it's, it's what makes someone successful in sports. I think it's what makes someone successful in business. I think it would make someone successful in life in general. Right. Uh, and I, I talk with a lot of people about how you help develop that in your kids, right? And mm. uh, because a lot of the people that I've talked to that have been very successful all come from this background where it's like, I didn't have much. I sort of had this chip on my shoulder. I wanted to prove people wrong and, you know, all these things. And, you know, in most cases, the people I'm talking to have all been very successful and their kids are growing up with a lot more privilege than they had. So the question becomes like, well, how do you have your kids be hungry? And, and you know, I've had this conversation with, you know, a handful of, of different people on the show and off. And I loved what Joe talked about on your show, that he basically manufactures adversity for his kids so his kids don't grow up with privilege and they know how to get through adversity. And I mean, I think he talked about having like a Kung Fu master or something to that Live extent it, yeah. lives at his house whose sole job is an hour in the morning and the hours in the night is to basically kick his kid's butt and teach them toughness. I mean, it was unbelievable to hear this story. Yeah. And I, I think if, if you introduce your children to sports and they make the commitment to it, the big commitment you have is to make sure they stick with it. Don't let them quit. 
And even if they're on the bench, second string, who cares? Don't let them quit. Because I think the grit and grind comes from sports. Uh, we can do so much as parents. Obviously, if we wrap them up and helicopter them and, as Joe says, put them in bubble wrap, we know deep inside they're not going to be prepared for the world. They're, they're going to be more have to be more prepared for the world upcoming than we have. Oh my gosh, think about it. My yeah. my seven year old and three year old grandson, what the heck is it gonna look like when they're twenty five and twenty eight? And and uh so they've got to be able to grit and they've got to be able to grind. And sure, you gotta get the education, go to school, you know, stay strong, stay smart, be physically active. But man, you gotta be grinding because they're gonna have to grind. So if they're grinding today, playing little league baseball or soccer or whatever it may be, or football or, you know, I think that's such a good thing. And the parents just, because you know what, when my son, who, as you know, played minor league baseball and through the ranks, and I, we have so many conversations about baseball. I'd say, who, who are some of your best coaches? We talked about this over Thanksgiving, you know, Joe Kelly, I mean, uh, uh, Kelly, uh, Dan Kelly. I go, why? Cause he taught me the game. Dan Kelly had rough edges. He was at RB and Rancho Bernardo. He played you know, for Blaylock. He coached for Blaylock. So he knew baseball. Uh, but he had these hard edges and some kids would, I'm not listening to him. He's yelling at me. But Andy goes, he said to me, he goes, all I did was flush that other stuff out because I knew this guy could teach me the game. I go, really? Yep. And this was when Andy was like, I, I, seventh grade or sixth grade. I go, he's figuring that out. Like I know he yells and everything, but then he said, dad, you've, you've kind of got a loud voice and you yell and, and you know, it didn't really scare. It scared us at first, but then we figured it all out. And he goes, that's what I did with Dan. So yeah. it, it made him a better man uh, because he listened to somebody teach him the game of baseball, he became a better baseball player. Uh, and that's what I hope kids do in sports. They find a mentor, mom and dad's, can't do it all. And if they That's think right. they can, their kid is going to suffer. You know, you, you can't do it all. You, so hopefully you get them in a right program and, and you know, coaches, I know coaches. I'm going, that one there is going to be good for them. That one may kick some butt, but they're going to teach them the, uh, and her the game of life, you know, and, and the, and the game they're in. So, uh, sport is that equalizer of helping the parents out. You just got to introduce them to it. I have a, I had a guest on the show, um, also a friend of mine. He's a, a commanding officer in the Marine Corps. And he currently, I think his squadron's around 300 Marines. Wow. Uh, 80% of the Marines are under 25. That's, <laughs> that's very young. Actually, one of your really interesting statistic, Mike, he was telling me, it was like, for, what the, forget the number, 65% of the Marines uh, that are in his squadron have only known a post COVID world. They all join the Marine Corps. It's just how young these Marines wow. are join the Marine Corps after COVID, which is really, you know, kind of fascinating that they've only known the Marine Corps post COVID. But we were talking about how, because he's, you know, my age and how you reach young kids. I mean, you know, 22 year old kids, you know, it's different. It's not like it was when we were, and, you know, he gave the analogy of like, you know, when we were younger, grab the guy by the face mask yeah. and shake him, and like that resonates. And uh, it doesn't really work with the young generation, but what he did say, and I, I think it's interesting is if you give the guy, give the, the, the younger generation purpose, or you give them meaning of why we're doing this or what we're trying to accomplish together, They'll do anything. They, they, I mean, they're, they're capable, they're hardworking, they're smart, they're intelligent, they're all those things, but they just need to understand or at least have that feeling of what they're doing has meaning in, in, in a bigger picture. And, you know, I, I, I just think about sports and I think of Andy and I think of a tough coach and, you know, I think it's something that does come out of sports is if you know deep in your heart that that coach wants you to be better and you want to be better then you're going to take the yelling and the screaming and the criticism, right? Because it's like, uh, he, he's at the end of the day, he's pushing you to help you reach the goal that you've already set for yourself. And I, I think that that's, that's something that, that does come out of sports. And you know, in, in coaching, if, if, uh, if an athlete listens to that coach intently and, and tries hard, that coach is going to be, you know, people say, well, he's the coach's favorite. Well, because 
the kid is listening to the coach, learning, That's right. uh, uh, doing the drill, maybe making a mistake, coming back. What do I, what do I do wrong? And uh, of course the coach is going to, it's a teachable kid. And, and that coach now wants to see that uh, uh, boy or girl succeed more than anybody because right. they're teachable. They're, they're learning and coaches are drawn to success of a, of a, of an athlete. Uh, but if, but if, but if they, if, 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 you know, the kid doesn't like the sound of the voice or it was too loud or whatever, or you make me do drills. Or why am I doing extra? Yeah. I mean, uh, parents, I just hope you can put them into a program and I'm not saying sports for everybody. I don't care if it's a camp. I don't care if it's a, uh, a, a computer school. I don't care what it is, but get them into something where they can find a, a, a mentor to, to push them along. Yeah. No, I, I agree. I, I think one of the things about um, athletics, especially at the high level, it's not the same. I mean, you know, kids, eight, nine, 10 years old, there's daddy ball, mommy, you're, you know, it's very political. But like when you get to like college and, and the professional level, it's a meritocracy, right? Like, <laughs> like, like that head coach of whatever sport it is, he's going to play the people who he believes give them the best chance of winning. And you know, I, I think as the athlete, you go into it realizing that. So you compete on a day in, day out basis because you want to be that person. Uh, and, and, you know, that's another world that I think translates really well to the professional world because, you know, once you get into the real business world, you got to realize it's a meritocracy. Everybody wants to be an entrepreneur. Everybody wants to be the next Elon Musk or, you know, start the next unicorn company. But like, no one's going to give that to you. You got to go out there and earn it. Um, and, you know, I think it's the same as, as, you know, being a world champion in, uh, in, in the Ironman, right? Like, I mean, there's some great stories about, uh, um, you know, some of the epic battles that have occurred in the past, but like, I mean, you got to earn that. I've never once brought a champion to an Ironman finish line that I know didn't work to get there. I mean, insane. You can't, you can't fake it. There's no faking an Ironman and there's no faking. If you want to be a CTO of a, of a major company, you, you got to put in the grit and the grind. You have to put in, it's funny. We keep saying grit and grind because, because uh, a good friend of mine, Rhonda Valeri, who's the CIO That's of right. Herbalife. She wrote the book, grit and grind. She'll love this. I'll send her the podcast yeah. and, and there's no faking it. So when those, and, and there's no faking it for the 17 hour finisher. I stood at 2019, the last, Iron Man we had in Hawaii before the pandemic with Jan Ferdino. He's our goat. He he is Olympic gold medalist, the one Kona three times, has won everything, it holds the course record in Kona. And we're at the he comes back at like fifteen hours to party with us and bring the uh final what I call the final winners in. And now it's about forty five minutes to go and he's standing there and Jan is six foot three, six foot four. He's just a He's just a specimen of a, of a, of an athlete. And he looks down at me, he goes, Riley, I, I don't believe this. I go, what, what are you talking about? Look at that woman who just finished going 1640. I could never do that in a million years. How does she, how'd she do that? How could she be out there that long? And here a world champion many times over and a gold medalist in all of a 16 hour and 45 minute everyday human finisher, because he couldn't believe she could, he, he knew, he goes, I, I couldn't do be out there that long. In other words, what he's yeah. saying to me, I'd quit. I'd be done. Yeah. I'm not going to go out there that long. Uh, so that tells you what type of event it is, but it also tells you, you know what? She just did what Jan did. Obviously he went faster. She finished what she started and it took That's her right. 16 hours and 45 minutes <laughs> to do it. Yeah. So, uh, it, it, it resonates when when you see something like that and then you get into a business meeting with eight people. And I remember those conference rooms. And so do you, Greg, of, you know, you, you'd get, jump out with an idea and there'd be like two of you going, yeah, yeah. And, and the others, no, I don't want to do that. And I'm thinking, yeah. oh, my gosh, this is a heck of a how are we going to work this one out? You know, and but you got to try to find that finish line together. I mean, if you don't, the company's going away. That's right. Well, look, Mike, I, I really appreciate, uh, you, you coming on and doing this, man. It's, it's, it's been an honor to call you a friend and I've, I've, I've enjoyed, uh, our time together and the conversations we've had. And maybe, maybe we can do this again with a, a Guinness and a Jameson. 
Well, uh, that's not too bad. I'm I'm leaving my uh, Patrick, my older brother's 80th uh, birthday party is in outside of Austin, and the whole brothers and sisters, nieces and nephews, some great nieces and nephews are going to be there. And I think I think there might be a little Guinness and a little uh, <laughs> a little Irish whiskey flowing. <laughs> it's funny, Rose. She said to me uh, yesterday. Now, because because you know all the spouses will be there, and and uh, she said, no, you guys aren't going to go crazy. I go, honey, you've been with me forty some years. You've been at these things. I I got no control. I'm one. I'm the youngest one. I, I got no control over the big brothers and That's sisters. Right. <laughs> so I, we're gonna have a blast. Uh, it's amazing. Yeah, I, I'm. Uh, I'm. I'm actually going to be meeting up with a bunch of my old college buddies here this this weekend, and we get together, you know, four or five, six times a year, whatever it is, and it's it's wild. Like we we part we party like we're still in college, and I, I think I had the same conversation <laughs> with my wife recently, who, by the way, partakes. Uh, she's she's having yeah. fun as much as anyone, but you're like. No, it's never going to change. Like, why would it change? It, like, it's not going to change. We're going to not find this fun in the future. Like, we found it fun for the last 30 years. Like, so anyways, Mike, well, I appreciate it, buddy. It was great speaking with you. All right, Greg. And you know what? I still, one of the most amazing things about you is when you first, when you showed me the picture of your size and weight <laughs> in the same, in the Aztec uniform, I go, oh, that's not you. Oh yeah, that's me. I could not believe, I still to this day, and then look at you, you know, doing CrossFit and everything and, and, yeah. uh, how big you were, but you had to be on the, on the line. You, you couldn't, you <laughs> if you were the you size did. today, you'd be, you better be fast because you'd be a tight end. You know, <laughs> I, I, I think I have that anxiety dream. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you ever have these sports anxiety dreams, but I'll have these dreams where all of a sudden it's like I'm, I have to play in a game or oh. something like that and I can't find my, helmet and i'm like how am i gonna play i'm like 210 pounds i'm gonna get crushed out there and uh then i wake up in a cold sweat okay. <laughs> i have them because i ran so many you know you go to sleep at night my dad ran track at ohio state he actually ran yeah. on the same team with jesse owens and and uh yeah. he was a miler and he would tell me about these dreams of of running away from somebody chasing him and his legs wouldn't move. And I always thought yeah. that was funny. And then that started happening to me when I was That's running, right. I'd be running. I go, where's everybody going? And I was yeah. like stuck in mud and it's the worst anxiety dream. You, you just can't go anywhere and everybody's leaving you. Oh, I've been there. 